Hello. Today, we're going to be starting with chapter one. This will be the first of two lectures covering chapter one. In this chapter, we're going to get an overview of the field of psychology in terms of its historical roots, particularly historical roots from within the discipline of philosophy. And we're also going to get a feel for the major theoretical perspectives uh, within the field of psychology that shape the field historically. In the second chapter one lecture, we will be talking about research methods in psychology. All right. Slides pulled up here. So, as I was saying, chapter one provides an overview of the field of psychology. To begin with, we have to provide a decent definition of what we're talking about when we use the word psychology. So, I thought that a useful starting point would be to provide such a definition. When you ask a layperson, what do you mean when you say psychology? Usually, most people define the term psychology as the study of the mind. And that's a good enough definition uh, for most people outside of the discipline of psychology. But really, the definition of psychology is much more precise than that. The first component of our definition is that psychology is a science. And when we say that psychology is a science, what we mean by that is that we rely upon the empirical methods of scientific investigation. We try to avoid relying on such methods as intuition or tradition, or even relying on our own common sense. Um, you'll find in this course that in many cases, our common sense can lead us astray when it comes to our judgments about human behavior and the nature of the mind. So we rely on the scientific method within the field of psychology. The second component of our definition, the science of what? Well, to begin, it's the science of mental activity. Mental activity is everything that's happening beneath the hood, so to speak. Uh, everything that you're experiencing from moment to moment that only you have access to. It's your subjective experience, every memory you're experiencing, every thought that you have, decisions that you're making, all of that, all of the things that you experience within your mind that only you have access to. That's what we mean by mental activity. And then finally, it's also the science of behavior, which is the objective side of psychology. So mental activity is what we would consider the subjective side of psychology, that which only the individual has access to. Behavior, on the other hand, is much more objective and easy to measure than is mental activity, because behavior is that which we, that, uh, which we do, the things that we do with our bodies. And these are measurable things. So behavior is what human beings do. Mental activity is what human beings experience. You have to account for both of these things if you're going to have a full picture of the human condition in which psychology is attempting to make. Then finally, the last component of our definition is that psychology makes the assumption that everything that's happening in our moment-to-moment -moment awareness and behaviors, everything about us, everything that we do, ultimately comes out of our brain not just what we do, but everything that we feel, everything that we think, all mental activity, all behavior is the result of processes that occur within the brain. It's hard to imagine that the activity of 180 billion or so neurons could be responsible for all of this, but it seems to be the case. Best evidence suggests that it is. Next, we will talk about the historical origins of the discipline of psychology, particularly the historical origins from which psychology came out of the discipline of philosophy. We typically trace psychology back to the ancient discipline of philosophy that came out of ancient, ancient Greece. Uh, philosophy has been with us for many, many years. But it was the ancient Greeks, folks like Socrates, 
and Plato and Aristotle who asked questions about the mind, just to name a few. There were many Greek philosophers who asked questions about the mind. But the mind-body problem was a prime issue for these philosophers. And the mind-body problem is the question of the nature of the mind itself and the relationship between the mind and the body. The two most common solutions, if you will, to the question of the mind-body problem are dualism and materialism. So most people would probably be considered dualists because dualists believe that the mind and the body are separate, or you might say that the mind and the brain are separate. But a dualist believes fundamentally that mind is made out of something that's non-material, whether it be the soul or the spirit, that ultimately there's something about being a human being that can't be reduced to the physical matter of our bodies. So if you believe in some form of an immaterial soul or spirit that survives the body after death, then by defini de definition, that makes you some form of a dualist. Folks like Socrates and Plato, for example, were dualists. Uh, probably the most famous dualist was René Descartes, the French mathematician and philosopher who popularized his own form of dualism, which became known as Cartesian dualism. Descartes was a good philosopher and a good scientist, and he kind of wanted to be a good Catholic, because he was a Catholic, but also be a good scientist and philosopher. So he was trying to have his cake and eat it too with this form of dualism that that he promoted that became known as Cartesian dualism. But the basic idea between Cartesian dualism is that the soul somehow lives inside the brain when the person is alive, and that the soul exits the, bo exits the body after the person is deceased. Uh, so there is a connection made between the soul and the brain, but ultimately there is still a distinction between the ultimate real self, which is spiritual, and the physical body, which uh, that self inhabits. So Cartesian dualism is, is very common, and most folks I would be willing to wager wager probably subscribe to some form of Cartesian dualism or another. However, the mainstream position within most of the scientists, and particularly within the discipline of psychology these, psychology these days, is the position of materialism, which is the idea that everything is ultimately rooted in the physical world. And when it comes to the mind, the materialist take on the mind-body problem says that we are basically the result of our brain activity. Everything that we experience and do, feel, it's all the result of brain activity. And when the brain ceases to function, when the brain dies, then that's the end of the person. Everything about being a person is dependent upon activity that's happening in the brain. That's essentially the materialist take on the mind-body problem. And there have certainly been a number of prominent materialist philosophers over the years Aristotle is usually credited as being one of the early materialists when it comes to the question of the mind-body problem. Uh, and there have been many materialists since, but the basic idea is that the mind is rooted in the activity of the brain. Materialism is the mainstream position of most psychology these days, and I, I would say of, of much of the sciences more broadly. Mainstream psychology tends to take a materialist position on the mind-body problem. That doesn't mean that you have to be a materialist to be a good psychologist. It just means that most of the mainstream theories that you're going to see within the discipline adhere to some form of materialists' uh, presuppositions and assumptions. So psychology ultimately came out of the discipline of philosophy because philosophers have been asking these questions about the mind for thousands of years. But it wasn't until 1879 that psychology itself was officially declared its own independent discipline. We'll come to that, back to that in a moment. One thing that I will say about the history of the discipline of psychology, particularly the early years, is that psychology as a discipline has been, uh, well, you could say that psychology could be characterized as a war between different theoretical orientations. And as one theory would come and go, a new theory would come along to replace it. And people would tend to be very loyal to their particular theoretical orientation and defend it quite fiercely. And, and there is still some of that that occurs to this day 
uh, within the social sciences, psychology included. But I must say that in recent years, the discipline of psychology has moved more in the direction of taking a more inclusive stance when it comes to theory so that a good psychologist could be influenced by multiple uh, theories within the discipline. Nonetheless, the early history of the discipline, as I said, was characterized by the rise and fall of several theoretical orientations that form the core of what you might think of as the classical uh, theories within the discipline of psychology. So in this table, you see a list of the classical theories that we're going uh, to be discussing in this chapter. But not only in this chapter, you will see that these theoretical approaches uh, within the discipline of psychology pop up again and again, uh, some of them more than others, but you will see that they pop up again and again uh, elsewhere in the course in uh, future chapters. So this table provides a preview of what's to come. As I mentioned before, the discipline of psychology is usually given the birth date uh, of sometime in 1879. We say that psychology officially began as its own discipline, separate from the discipline of philosophy. Uh, in 1879, a professor at the University of Leipzig in Germany, a professor by the name of Wilhelm Wundt, founded the very first psychology laboratory, or you might say first experimental psychology laboratory. And he had a lot of students there in that lab and uh, became quite a a popular place at the time in the university. His leading protege was a student by the name of Edward Tischner, who later went on to become uh, a somewhat important uh, academic figure in psychology himself. But it was actually Tischner who named their theoretical perspective structuralism. And the reason why they referred to their theoretical orientation as structuralism is because they aimed to break the mind down into its component parts. They, they were of the belief that the mind could sort of be taken apart the same way that you can take apart a car engine and, and sort of reassemble it, that the mind can somehow be broken down into several component parts. That, that was the idea behind structuralism at the time. And uh, they were known for uh, conducting some of the very first experiments that, that ever happened uh, in reaction time, for example. And reaction time, of course, is measuring how long it takes for a person to react uh, to a particular stimulus or event, you definitely want to have good reaction time when you're driving a car, for example, even more so if you're a pilot, um, when you're operating heavy machinery, dangerous machinery, reaction time uh, tends to be a, a rather important part of one's skill set. But in any case, reaction time research began there at that laboratory in Germany, and reaction time uh, research continues to be an important area of research within the discipline of psychology, uh, even to this very day. Another line of research that they uh, promoted at the time in that laboratory was uh, a method uh, that became known as introspection. This, on the other hand, didn't really pan out as being a very uh, useful approach to conducting research within the discipline of psychology. But introspection, uh, short-lived as it was as a research tool, the idea behind it was to have research particip participants uh, provide uh, <clears throat> detailed verbal reports, uh, detailed verbal reports of, of various experiences that they would have and then uh, record and, and give back to the researcher. <clears throat> so again, the reaction time research conducted by Wundt, Tischner, and the structuralists had a lasting legacy. Uh, however, their, their introspection method didn't really pan out, and the theoretical orientation of structuralism itself wasn't very long-lived. It, it didn't really ultimately pan out as uh, a long-term, long-lasting, rather, what you might say, theory within the discipline of psychology. So structuralism fizzled out pretty quickly, but the lasting legacy uh, was left in the fact that the existence of their laboratory showed that you could attempt to study the mind scientifically. And that, that is really the ultimate legacy of the structuralist, is for getting the field of experimental psychology off the ground. I would say that, that, there, that, that, there's their, that is their biggest, uh, longest lasting legacy that they should be credited for. And they're, of course, also credited as being uh, the founders of, 
uh, of the field of psychology, so that's no small thing either. The next theoretical perspective that I would like to discuss is the theoretical orientation of functionalism, which was promoted uh, by William James, who was a medical school professor at Harvard University initially in his career. But he became aware of the research being conducted by the structuralists in Germany, and he was intrigued by the idea of applying the scientific method to the mind. So he was influenced in that regard by the structuralists. However, William James was somewhat opposed to the structuralist idea of breaking the mind down into its various component parts. William James didn't really see that as the most useful way of approaching the scientific study of the mind. Instead, William James uh, applied Darwinian thinking to the mind, meaning that uh, he took the ideas of natural selection proposed by Charles Darwin, which was a very recent idea at the time, by the way, on the origin of species had just come out around this time. But William James was very influenced by the thinking of Charles Darwin. And William James, instead of trying to create a map of the mind, is more interested in identifying the various functions of different mental capabilities in terms of evolutionary purposes. In other words, how do these mental faculties allow someone to survive and reproduce more effectively? And this was really the beginning of what's now known as evolutionary psychology. So these days, there aren't really any functionalists that I know of, or at least functionalists who call themselves functionalists. The, the idea of functionalism has kind of morphed into what is now uh, in, in modern day times known as evolutionary psychology, which is very much still an alive uh, and vibrant field of inquiry within the field of psychology. So that's functionalism. It applies Darwinian thinking to the mind. Another uh, very important figure within the history of psychology, perhaps more well known than either Wundt or Tischner or William James would be that of Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud is a monumentally important figure within the history of psychology because Sigmund Freud, broadly speaking, is often credited as getting the field of psychotherapy off the ground. He was very interested in the clinical side of psychology. He was originally trained as a neurologist. He's a very gifted young man who got into medical school at the age of 17 and trained as a neurologist to become very interested in studying patients at the time who had been diagnosed with a condition that was then called hysteria. And hysteria was sort of a catch-all diagnosis that was often given to mentally ill women at the time who had been shut up in sanitariums, or they were called insane asylums at the time. Or sanitariums might have been another word that was used. But in any case, you had these uh, mostly female patients who were locked up in straight jackets uh, with all sorts of strange, mysterious, unexplainable psychological complaints like spastic tics and panic attacks and hallucinations and you know, all sorts of strange things that couldn't be explained. But they developed this catch-all term called hysteria, which was sort of a slight towards women, really, because uh, the word hysteria literally interpreted means tilted uterus or wandering uterus. So what they were trying to kind of suggest there was that mental illness was kind of a woman's thing. But uh, also keep in mind that this was during Victorian Europe in the late 1800s in Austria. And this was a very sexually repressed culture at the time. So uh, a, a, lot of these, a lot of these women uh, may have had some hang-ups uh, that, that came out of that culture. And this led Freud to believe that perhaps uh, sexuality was an extremely important part of human nature. And through working with his patients over the years, he developed this form of therapy that became known as talk therapy, sometimes referred to as the talking cure. And, uh, and really, Freud gets credit as sort of being the, the founder of psychotherapy, more or less. In any case, through working with his patients over the years, Freud uh, came to believe that the mind was basically made up of three major parts, the id, the ego, and the superego. Perhaps you've heard these terms before. But according to Freud, we're all born into the world little bundles of id. And the id is just nothing but pure selfishness. The id seeks pleasure and avoids pain. That's what the id is all about. 
you could say that the id operates according to the pleasure principle. But at some point along the way, developmentally, as children, we realize that we, we can't get away with doing whatever it is that we feel like doing at any moment. There are consequences for acting in such a way. So we learn that we, ha we have to deal with the world around us in a reasonable, rational way. And at that point, uh, that uh, is when the ego develops. And the ego is the part of the self, according to Freud, that is the rational decision maker uh, who tries to weigh the consequences and try to think things through uh, before uh, engaging in a particular behavior. Then finally, later in childhood, maybe even in adolescence, we develop what Freud called a superego, which is uh, the part of the self that is concerned with morality and guilt, you know, makes us feel bad um, when we've done something wrong. You can think of the superego as the conscience. So again, you can think of the id as sort of the, the impulsive, selfish, almost evil part of the mind, if for lack of a better word. You can think of the ego as the rational part of the mind and the superego as the part of the mind that's all about morality and ethics and makes you feel guilty and makes you feel ashamed when you've done, so, done something that you should have done. So Freud uh, developed this model of the self that was based on these three components and this model of psychotherapy, where the goal was to try to bring the id, the ego, and the superego kind of into balance. Freud thought that if, uh, if any one of these three structures was too powerful, then it could create some form of, of uh, mental illness or neuroticism, as he called it. For example, if your id was too powerful, that could make you behave in an impulsive way that you'd later regret. If the ego was too powerful, it kind of made you into this kind of vain, boring, self-absorbed sort of person. If the superego was too powerful, then you're walking around guilt-ridden, feeling bad, constantly always thinking you've done something wrong. So uh, bringing these three sub-personalities, if you will, into balance was the goal of psychotherapy, according to Sigmund Freud. And he aimed to accomplish this through methods early on, uh, like hypnosis was a, a method that he used pretty frequently early on in his career, although he became disillusioned with it pretty early on. And he, uh, he turned more to free association and dream analysis. So free association involves just letting clients talk about whatever is on their mind from moment to moment, just kind of thinking out loud. And in dream analysis, of course, you know, involves uh, keeping a dream diary and talking about your dreams during psychotherapy. Because Freud believed that our dreams were, uh, were symbols of, of deep unconscious wishes from our id that had been hidden from our conscious mind. He believed that we had this strong unconscious part of the mind that we weren't aware of or our secret wishes and desires resided. So Freud was all about bringing the unconscious out into the light of day and bringing the, the ego and the superego uh, into a, a state of alignment and balance, if you will. And Freud's ideas were popular for many, many, many years. And in fact, uh, many psychotherapists today and counselors still rely on some of his ideas <clears throat> within the field of counseling. Uh, the, the problem with Freud, though, is that uh, the scientific support for his ideas are mixed at best. There's not a lot of scientific support for Freud's ideas. And they're, they're really hard to, to measure, really hard to test. It's really difficult to measure something like an id or an ego or a superego. So for that reason, uh, Freud has been criticized by a lot of folks as being unscientific because his ideas are, are so difficult uh, to, to scientifically measure. Uh, the next field of theory that I want to talk, the next major uh, theoretical orientation, if you will, uh, that I want to mention is uh, that of Gestalt psychology, which was uh, a theoretical orientation that arose out of Germany in the early 1900s, largely as a uh, response against structuralism. Remember, the structuralists, their goal was to break the mind down into its various component parts. And uh, the Gestalt psychologists, also out of Germany, they, they thought this wasn't the most useful idea. They, they didn't really think that break, trying to break the mind down into its parts was, was really a very useful idea. And, uh, and for that reason, they were opposed to structuralism. They were, they were known for this catchphrase that goes, the whole is more than the sum of its parts, or the whole is different from the sum, from the sum of its parts, uh, which was basically a, a way of neatly summing up their 
their criticism of structuralism, because structuralism was all about breaking the mind down into its parts. And here you have the Gestalt psychologist saying that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So Gestalt is a German word that means whole. So uh, the Gestalt psychologists were very much interested in how we perceive the world and form a, a conscious, unified, whole experience from moment to moment out of our various senses that seem to come, come together to, to form this unified whole. But they were very interested in consciousness. And in fact, much of the early research on visual perception came out of Gestalt theory. We're going to talk a little bit more about Gestalt theory when we get to the chapter on sensation and perception. The next major theoretical orientation that I want to discuss is behaviorism. And this is another orientation that's going to come up again in the course later on, namely in chapter six when we talk about learning. But the behaviorists were very opposed to Freud's ideas uh, because they believed, as I said before, that Freud's ideas were very unscientific and difficult to measure. So the behaviorists uh, who are often credited uh, as being founded by John Watson, John B. Watson, usually considered the father of behaviorism, uh, they believed that uh, the best way to study psychology is to study behavior and not concern yourself with that which is not measurable. So any sort of mental events, the whole subjective side of the human experience, they weren't concerned with really at all. They, they were more concerned with just studying that which is measurable. And in fact, uh, the behaviorists believe that psychology should only study that which is measurable and should avoid exploration of any sort of unmeasurable internal events like thoughts or memories or feelings or anything like that. Uh, so the behaviorist approach emphasizes the role of the environment as well. So uh, John B. Watson, the founder of behaviorism, was famous for saying that he could turn any child into anything if you gave him uh, the correct environment to, to raise the child in. It was a very bold statement to make. He even said that he could do that uh, without regard for who, who the children's parents were, no matter what their genetics, no matter what their family background, he could turn any child into anything given the right environment, which is kind of a bold, arrogant statement to make. And Watson was kind of an arrogant sort of guy. He was most well known for the little Albert experiment, uh, which we're gonna talk about in chapter six. Uh, behaviorism is still very much a dominant and influential school of thought within the field of psychology. It's still very much alive and well, and a lot of the best treatments that we have for mental disorders come out of behavioral theory, uh, behavioral theory rather. But for the purposes of this chapter, at this point, what I want you to know about behaviorism is that it's all about making psychology a hard science, and they wanted to focus exclusively on measurable behavior and avoid discussions of internal events. So measurable behavior only, hence behaviorism. They also focused rather heavily on the role of the environment in shaping behavior, so they weren't uh, big on genetics or hereditary influences. They were very much towards the nurture side of the famous nature versus nurture debate. The next theoretical perspective that I would like to discuss is humanistic psychology. And humanistic psychology is sort of, uh, you might think of as the feel good, uh, the, a little bit of an oversimplification, but kind of the feel good side of psychology. Humanistic psychology was championed by Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. And I'm going to talk more about both of these guys later in the course when we talk about motivation theory and when we talk about uh, psychotherapy. Maslow and Rogers come up a lot in those chapters. So uh, this is definitely going to come up uh, again as well. But humanistic psychology is all about focusing on the positive side of human potential. Uh, the humanistic psychologists they had a bone to pick with both Freud and the behaviorists. They didn't like Freud because Freud had this very dark, pessimistic view of human nature. He very much saw human beings as kind of being like animals and, and just pretending like they're civilized. Freud did not have a very high view of, of, of human nature. In fact, Freud was, was famous for saying that he basically believed that uh, it was almost impossible to be completely happy in life, that that misery is just kind of the, the default state of affairs and, and the human condition. And if you knew some things about Freud's life, which I'll talk about later in the course, you, you'll, you'll know why he had such a negative disposition. But in any case, Freud had sort of a, a dark view of humanity. 
And, and then on the other hand, you have the behaviorists who are basically denying the existence of our feelings and thoughts in inner life, uh, and denying half our experience and only focusing on that which is measurable on the outside. And it doesn't really leave a lot of room for free will the way that they focus on the way that the environment uh, controls our behavior. So uh, the humanists didn't like Freudians because they had a dark view of human nature. They didn't like the behaviorists because behaviorists kind of look at human beings like they're robots. The humanists wanted a more humanized view of the human condition, so hence humanistic psychology. And uh, humanistic psychology is all about trying to get people to uh, grow, to fulfill uh, all of their potential in life, and uh, looking at the positive side of human nature and our ultimate goodness. And uh, kind of a modern version of humanistic psychology is uh, what's now called positive psychology, which we'll talk about later in the course when we talk about the science of happiness. But uh, positive psychology is kind of an outgrowth of humanistic psychology. We'll talk more about Maslow's hierarchy of needs in the chapter on motivation, and we'll talk about Carl Rogers' concept of unconditional positive regard when we get to the chapter on psychotherapy. Uh, very influential ideas there. So we're going to be coming back to most of these major theories that we're talking about. We'll, we'll see them come up at least a couple more times throughout the course. Again, this is just an introductory chapter. Cognitive psychology is the area of psychology that is less of uh, a theor theoretical orientation and more of an area of focus. Although there is sort of a theoretical assumption that the, that the mind is kind of like a computer. So I guess there, there, it is sort of a theoretical orientation, but ultimately cognitive psychologists are interested in studying things like memory processes, decision-making, thinking, uh, all, all of the, those sorts of beneath the hood sort of things that the behaviorists said were impossible to measure, those are the things that the cognitive psychologists try to measure and study, and with some degree of success, by the way. It turns out that it's not as impossible to measure mental events as the behaviorists thought that it was, if you look at cognitive psychology literature. But Miller uh, is often credited as being uh, the founder of cognitive psychology. Sometimes you'll hear another guy by the name of uh, Ulrich Neisser, who's referred to as the founder of cognitive psychology. I'm not as concerned with this uh, field that you know the, the founders, that you know that cognitive psychology is the area of psychology that studies decision-making and memory and thinking processes and the use of our intelligence. <clears throat> Pardon me. There's another thing to know about cognitive psychology is that uh, cognitive psychologists often work with brain researchers and computer scientists and philosophers uh, to, to sort of uh, look at the mind in a unique way that's come to be known as cognitive neuroscience, which is understanding the cognitive processes at the level of the brain. Uh, but in any case, cognitive psychologists often like to compare the human mind to a computer. And uh, that's something that they've been both praised and criticized for over the years, but they're concerned with those internal mental processes. So those are the major theoretical orientations uh, classically speaking, that I want you guys to be familiar with at this point in chapter one. And again, those major theoretical orientations are going to pop up again later in the course. Like I said, these days, psychologists tend to not be as argumentative about theory as they used to be. For example, I'm particularly fond of all of the theories that I just went through. In some way or another, I see how they all have at least something to offer the field of psychology, maybe some of them more than others. But in any case, each theoretical perspective has a unique vantage point that is useful uh, to some degree when it comes to looking at the human mind. These days, instead of being loyal to a particular theoretical orientation, as we saw in the old days of the discipline, these days, most psychologists tend to have a particular area of focus that they where they spend their career studying a certain topic. Uh, for example, you have your biological psychologists, sometimes referred to as cognitive neuroscientists, or, uh, or brain psychologists. You hear a few different terms thrown around. But these are psychologists who are interested in understanding the mind and understanding behavior through understanding brain processes. And, and ultimately, uh, psychology is becoming more and more a science of the brain. There, there's so much overlap. Uh, between the, the fields of neurology and psychology that sometimes the, 
the, the lines between the two fields can become incredibly blurred. Uh, if you work at the individual differ differences level, you're interested in the things that people do and the differences between people. So you might be a behavioral psychologist, or maybe you study perception, how people visually perceive the world, or auditory processes, or maybe uh, you're interested and how people differ from each other in terms of personality or intelligence that would comprise the field of individual differences. So that means you're working at the level of the individual. Social psychologists are interested in the ways that human beings behave in groups and the effect that the presence of the group has upon the behavior of the individual. So, uh, so social psychology has a lot of overlap with the field of sociology. In fact, I teach sociology here at Pensacola State College, and uh, there's an incredible degree of overlap between a lot of the material that we talk about in sociology and uh, some of the material that we talk about in social psychology. But ultimately, social psychologists are concerned with the impact uh, that, that the group has on the individual and, and interpersonal dynamics and interpersonal behaviors and how people behave in groups. The next level up, next level of analysis would be cultural psychology, which would be the study of how our cultural beliefs and our cultural practices uh, affect our individual psychological makeups and how uh, people vary, how people are different depending upon the culture that they're raised in. And people often take for granted the impact of one's culture on one's personality or one's way of life. But that is what cultural psychologists are interested in, studying the impact uh, of culture on the mind and on behavior. So in this last slide, uh, we just see kind of a breakdown of some of the common work settings where psychologists work these days. Uh, as of, I believe these data are uh, up to date as of 2015, if I remember correctly. Uh, and, and it should still be similar today in 2019, you see some of the different uh, specializations and work settings. You see that clinical psychology, for example, is by far uh, the most common specialization in the field of psychology. We won't be talking about clinical psychology until way later in the course, towards the end of the course when we're talking about mental illnesses and mental health treatment. But by far, clinical psychology is the most popular area of specialization. In terms of work settings, uh, you have private companies, 27%, uh, 21% of psychologists are self-employed, <clears throat> most likely as clinical psychologists, and for the most part, but you see the largest representation of psychologists work for schools and universities, most likely as, as psychology professors, uh, so, such as myself. So that will conclude the very first lecture on chapter one, we've gotten a little bit of a background on the history of the discipline of psychology, how psychology came out of the discipline of philosophy. I provided with, I uh, provided a brief overview of the major classical theoretical orientations. So we've talked about, uh, to some degree, how the, the modern field of psychology looks today. Uh, the next lecture, uh, the final lecture from chapter one, is going to talk about research methods in psychology and how it is that psychologists go about uh, conducting research. I'm not going to lecture on every single topic in this chapter, and that will be true of all the chapters. I'm going to uh, provide lecturing on selected topics within each chapter that I feel are most important. So there will be material that you will come across in the textbook that I will talk about in the lectures. But I do lecture on what I feel is the most crucial material from each chapter. So I will see you next time in the part two lecture of chapter one when we talk about research methods in psychology.